you can see from our timeline on antebellum, this is late in the stage of the production of post-production where we actually had stems from sound mixes on the bottom audio tracks. I use a color coding system. Jared's timeline looks a little different than mine because he actually uses color coded clips. I use color coded tracks. So it's just my way of being able to see, okay, these are my sound effects. This is the music. These are my dialogue effects. So dialogue I've got on tracks one through four. It's mono dialogue where I select from the different microphones from dailies. I like to work with a polywave file of all the audio tracks recorded. And I pick and choose if I want an ISO mic or the, the boom mic or the mix mic or the mix track rather. A4, you can see I have a different color. It's kind of a cyan. That I like to reserve for ADR lines and additional recording. Uh, sometimes it's just literally spillover when I need a fourth track for dialogue. Sometimes ambience goes down there, a wild track. I always thought it was interesting that you have the time code track separating your, your top four audio tracks. Yes. So the, the time code track separates, I mean, it's a visual break, so I can basically see all my dialogue tracks above. So I know that that is what gets turned over. Everything below is temp. So temp sound effects. So I've got mono sound effects on tracks A5 through A8, or mono sound effects. And then I've got stereo sound effects on 9, 10, and 11. And then 5.1 effects on A12 and 5.1 background on A13. And then music stereo is on 14, 15, and 16. And then 17, 18, 19, that's uh, SM. I think that stands for STEM. Yeah. And then the bottom tracks, those are basically, this is the, the breakdown from a mix. So we have dialogue effects, background, and music in 5.1, the music, though, being in stereo. Looking at the timeline as a whole, there are a lot of markers on the upper track. That's our notes track, so V7 and it's labeled as notes. And so the different colors of ways that we communicate back and forth, I flag things sometimes with the white marker to things that I need to show the, the director, the producers, things that have changed. Internally, we'll use a magenta marker so I can see if Jared has something to present to me. A red marker signifies that there's an audio issue or something that needs addressing. We use the submaster effect a lot just to collapse tracks down. Like that opening shot, that's a stitch of like three different, like they shot it in three different parts, but we were able to create a temp for it using the submaster and save space. The two VFX tracks, we used the VFX with the bullet after it. That was like whatever was new. And then VFX with a check mark meant that it was at least reviewed or approved. So if no one had watched it, uh, it would still be on that first track. Once it had gotten eyes on it, then we moved it down to the VFX reviewed. And that's where it would hang out until a new version came in and it would replace itself with the newest and the latest, greatest, until it got through the DI approval and it was like final. Then we would drop it down to whatever the, you know, the lowest available track was. The marker window in the top left, that's where the file maker bread and butter is because these would come through in either for ADR, we would do it with text files. With DI, we would do a text file. So I would just, you know, select all the DI markers and export a text file of all of the, for example, for ADR, each part of the marker is a different field in FileMaker. So it's a tag. I'm going in order. It's like tag, the type, uh, the character, the line, and then the reason and a note or a Q code. So that's why you see multiple equal signs in a row is just to account for all these different fields. So that way, FileMaker knew that this string of text wasn't just one long, garbly sentence. It was a whole bunch of different information that's organized into different chunks. So it knew to put Elizabeth as the character name and unintelligible darling into the line area of the ADRQ sheet. So an export of these markers could be parsed and then displayed very quickly into a PDF file. 
the same thing would go for VFX, except VFX usually was exported in the form of an EDL. So an EDL would be fed into FileMaker. And if a locator was found in the EDL file, then FileMaker would know that that event in the EDL is something worth parsing and it would carry on through into the, the VFX database, taking the record time codes, the source time codes, the source name, which would be the tape name. Um, so the, the marker was just an identifier that told FileMaker, hey, look over here.